do I think the IMF used a a very clear view that they have at an institutional level that Brexit is a bad idea to colour their economic forecasts? No, I'm not quite that cynical. When we were doing our analysis, the UK is the sixth richest country in the world, or a bit more, depending on which numbers you use, or less. But its political stability ranking is 67th in the world. Whether it's six months, three years, or five years, as long as you're a patient investor, mean reversion is going to be a really helpful tailwind now. This episode is made possible by Progressive Equity Research, providing freely available, engaging investment research and opportunities to hear from a wide range of small and mid-cap UK listed companies. Earlier this year, in episode 15, I spoke to Lawrence Hulse and Alex Wood about investing in the UK equity market from the perspectives of two UK-focused professional investors with distinctive strategies. More recently, on October the 17th, I got Laurie and Alex back together with Simon French, Chief Economist and Head of Research at City stockbroker Pamela Gordon, to ask the question, why invest in the UK? It was a great conversation on a live topic of interest for investors and one I hope to return to in future episodes. Simon frames the discussion with his expertise in interpreting macroeconomic data. Alex adds his perspective as an investor who spends much of his time talking to international investors about investing in the UK. And then Laurie talks of what he sees as a generational opportunity to buy abnormally cheap assets at the bottom end of the UK's out-of-favour stock market. As always, this is for information purposes only. This is not investment advice. I began by asking Simon a bit about his background before he set the scene regarding the state of the UK economy. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became an economist now working for a London-based broker? I gather you started life as a bit of a policy wonk, but then evolved. Is that right? You're right that my professional career started as a fast stream economist in the civil service, working on labour market issues, pensions issues at the slightly Soviet-styled named Department for Work and Pensions. I then got my big at least big break in the civil service by moving to the central government to the cabinet office through the financial crisis and into the first years of the coalition government. And then 2014 came along and I had the opportunity to come to Pamela Gordon on a, on a one-year secondment, actually. And then yeah, I think I was here about three months and the then chief executive pushed a quite attractive permanent contract across the table. So I never went back to the civil service and I've been here ever since trying to learn how that intersection between the UK economics, the macro that I had learned in my time in government and capital markets, how they intersect, how they're interdependent, which I think we're going to talk about later in the podcast. Had you had prior experience or an interest in stock markets or financial markets? Well, only that I did my master's in economics and finance having done a pure economics undergrad. So I had some idea of the theory, but I have to say, and this is perhaps reflected in some of the public policy decisions of the last decade, the level of understanding interaction with financial markets within the civil service, within the economics profession is pretty limited. So vocationally, I came as pretty wet behind the ears, I have to say. I think it's pretty interesting reading your stuff. You've become quite a critic of some of the major forecasts of the UK economy, given your background. I think that's fascinating. But before we talk about that, can we just start by a framing question? From your perspective, what is the state of the UK economy? And if you can sort of talk around it as well, how does an understanding of macroeconomic conditions help us understand the stock market from the perspective of investors? So first of all, the state of the nation, if you like, far less pessimistic than much of the commentary. One of the things that has frustrated me, and I'm pleased you picked up on this, has been the idea that 
the UK is facing uniquely the economic challenges of an aging population, a mature infrastructure, a battle between the returns to capital and the returns to labour, the fallout from the pandemic. Yes, we have the additional idiosyncratic challenge of leaving the customs union in the single market and reconfiguring our trading relationship. But that is not the predominant driver of macroeconomic trends. And my critique of rival forecasters, if you like, has been for the framing of everything that is UK macro through the challenges of Brexit. Actually, the UK is in a low growth phase. But actually, if you track economic growth since economic performance since 2016, and indeed since the end of the pandemic, the UK sits middle of the pack compared to its G7 comparators. And so, when you shift this to, well, what does this mean for financial markets? My view, a long-held view, but just because it's long-held, I don't think it's wrong, is that some, if not all, of the very obvious discount on valuations, be it price earnings, EV, EBITDA, price book, dividend yield, any of those metrics where the UK looks very, very keenly valued, a discount that has emerged since the Brexit vote. The degree to which that has been a overly bearish interpretation of both the economics in real time, but also the economic pathway the UK can expect from here. I think that's where I've tried to position my analysis. Not to, in a Panglossian way, sort of pretend that Brexit doesn't come with its own challenges, but to lean in against those commentators who have put the UK on the naughty step, the uninvestable step, based on, I think, more rhetorical factors rather than fundamental analysis of the UK economy and its public companies. It does seem repeatedly over the last 12 months, at least, and probably longer, that every time you see media reports of forecasts by these august bodies about the prospects of the UK economy, the UK is singled out as being bottom of the pack or, in some cases, an outlier. But every time we get official statistics, particularly revisions to official statistics, the phrase is better than expected as if it's a big surprise, but it happens every time. So I guess the question is, are these people politically motivated or are these people just using the wrong models? There is a bit of both. Take the International Monetary Fund's forecasts, which was the most recent sort of critique I had. Do I think the IMF used a very clear view that they have at an institutional level that Brexit is a bad idea to colour their economic forecasts? No, I'm not quite that cynical, but, and there is a but, when I look at the quality of the analysis, did they use the correct interest rate assumptions? Did they use the correct assumptions regarding the inflation outlook for the UK based on what we know about the outsized now negative disinflationary effects from energy prices and food prices going down? I felt there was it was just poor analysis, actually, which in many ways is kind of easier for me to critique than trying to build a sort of straw man of the being an institutional bias, because I feel more comfortable just going, your assumptions are wrong, the analysis is wrong, rather than wading myself into sort of politics, which I can't really prove or disprove. I am pretty confident that I can say the IMF technical analysis is shoddy. I think trying to sort of label their analysts as politically vested against the UK is a harder position to stake out credibly. So taking the ONS admission that the GDP series that they've been tracking for a number of years now, I think since before Brexit or around the Brexit period, has been systemically underestimating the size of the UK economy. I guess an investor can say, well, why do I even bother listening? Or they can say, are there any practical consequences of this? It absolutely is from a perspective of the UK is about 3% of the global economy by GDP. But investors don't just allocate slavishly. And we have two very good exponents of this on the podcast. They don't allocate slavishly based on those metrics. They also look at the growth trends and the degree to which what to expect in terms of future earnings, which is not a linear line from GDP, both outlook and what we know about recent past through to earnings. But there's a decent relationship, particularly for domestic focused companies. And I think those upward revisions from the ONS, which let's not 
pretend that measuring GDP is easy. There are three different methodologies. They don't always confirm each other's viewpoints. They're always subject to revisions. We're always learning more about the economy. I think the message it must send or should send, I think, to investors is GDP is part of a basket of data points to assess the health of an economy. It's a, it's a single measure, which is probably the best of a bad bunch, but take into account really good performance in terms of employment, particularly in the UK economy. We've hit two big exogenous shocks in recent years, Brexit and the pandemic. And yet, and even with then 515 basis points of interest rate tightening, the UK unemployment rate is still sub 5%. Extraordinary for those of us with long enough memories that when the UK economy hits a recession, you typically see 3 million unemployed, uh, 10% unemployment rate. I get that it's a lagged indicator and we still have some of that to come. But the resilience of the labour force is really encouraging from a point of view of not having scarring in the economy. When you go and speak to execs of companies, you know, if they've got product markets, labor markets that are impaired by a prolonged period of sluggish activity, workers become disillusioned, they lose their skills, product lines don't innovate, capital expenditure doesn't happen. The fact that we haven't had that scarring is probably as important as that GDP growth rate, the resilience of the UK labour market through a number of recent cycles. So Alex and Laurie are both specialist focused UK fund managers, but you must talk to global fund managers who allocate capital to the UK versus other options. Are you detecting any sense of change? Is there any evidence that allocators are sensing that and doing anything about it? There is good news, but I've got to contextualize it first, which is the valuation story of UK public assets is a long dated issue. And I've been broking that story to particularly US investors for coming up to seven years now since the discount emerged. The discount in and of itself is insufficient to get international investors to start crowding into public markets. We're seeing take privates where private capital is interested in UK public companies. But the idea of public investors reallocating, taking off their shorts on the UK market has not, there's no signs of that happening on a pure valuation ground. They're not now convinced of the analysis in the way they weren't two, three years ago. Where I have seen interest is what we're starting to see happening at a government level through the Edinburgh reforms and the Mansion House reforms. Because, and again, I'm sort of teeing up Alex and Laurie to talk later in the podcast about, as a fund manager, you must always be interested, I hope, you're not going to contradict me, on who, if you want to sell a stake to in a company, who you're going to sell it to, who's the next potential buyer of that stock. And the problem has been, and this is entirely agnostic of the macro, entirely agnostic of Brexit, the pandemic, has been the gradual reduced allocation, both from domestic fund managers and international fund managers to UK equities. Partly that is structural, as other parts of the world just arithmetically have grown faster. But partly this has been regulation domestically, where we haven't had what many fund managers have said to me is a natural UK buyer for UK equities, be it pension funds, be it retail investors. I think the pennies dropped. Without giving too much away, I'm in to see the Treasury again later this week to talk about what they're going to talk about in the budget later in the year, which is, there's no state secret here. Jeremy Hunt at his July Mansion House speech said, we'll come forward with more details in the budget. So I'm not releasing any state secrets, but I'd like to know what they're thinking about, because I think this is really important in terms of international investors going, okay, I like the valuation story. And buying your idea, Simon, the macro isn't as pessimistic as I seem to be presented with every time I open the the FT. But I do need that other buyers are going to come in and crowd my investment in. If there are signs of that, and I think there are, maybe we're getting close to that inflection point on new care equities. Before we move on to the investors here, how cheap is the UK market? I mean, you've been doing a lot of work and telling us it's cheap. And why can't it get cheaper? <laughs> I mean, it certainly can get cheaper albeit it's a risk-reward 
at these levels. Uh, so on a 10-year cyclically adjusted PE, I have the UK at about 9.7 times compared to European equities around 13, 14, and America and US equities around 30. So if you look at the historical ranges, that's very much towards the bottom end of the UK range. I'm never going to say we can't go lower, but it is a risk reward in an environment where Okay, public markets may have responded to a new interest rate environment, but I certainly think private markets have still to have their valuation moments in the sun or moments in the shadow, depending on which way you want to look at it. And I think a risk reward on that valuation measure, you can look at other metrics. My preferred way of measuring the valuation of UK companies is to look at a blended average of price earnings, EV, EBITDA, and price book. But then also adjust for the fact, which is a very valid pushback from investors, which is the UK market compositionally is made up of different weights of sectors. We only have 2% tech. It's 20% tech on the S&P 500. We're overweight commodities and banks, which you know across the world are at a lower rating because of their different growth profile. If you adjust for that, which I call my adjusted valuation measure, I think UK equities on a like for like apples with apples, not apples with pears comparison, is about 20% cheaper than global equities. And that's a pretty attractive valuation opportunity. I get that some people see it as a valuation trap. I work at a sell side stockbroker. I think it's a valuation opportunity. Is that historically the widest we've ever seen? Good question. I think 1989 is the only other parallel I can see. So late 80s, when you had some challenging UK macro, very high interest rates going into the European exchange or preparing the UK for the European exchange rate mechanism, a housing market that had sort of blown out of all proportion because of some tax changes, the fag end of the Lawson boom. That was a period where I find comparable spreads of valuations, but these are rare events indeed. So we're dealing with a very cheap asset, the UK stock market by comparative and historic levels, it's fair to say, has rarely been cheaper. Alex was the paper you wrote a few months ago, funnily enough, entitled Why Invest in the UK. From the perspective of, try and get this right, a catalyst-driven contrarian value investor, I hope I've got all the, uh, got it all there. Can you just tell us the message of this paper and why you think it's relevant for what you're doing? We speak to mostly international investors in the way when we're fundraising. And Everyone kept asking us very highbrow questions and we kept trying to point out the sort of actual specifics of the market and the price inefficiencies and the quality of the businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And we were repeating ourselves every single time. So we thought actually we'll just publish what we're talking about in a way that people can test and they can play with their own charts. And if it helps also people paste and copy things into their own reports, then that's no bad thing. And if we're wrong and we learn things, which we always do when we publish, that's no bad thing for us as well, which is another reason why I'm here. What we find is, look, stock markets work by perception of reality. In the long run, GDP and earnings growth for companies will ultimately dictate your returns. And if you go to America and ignore it and take away the Magnificent Seven, and then if you adjust for inflation, actually America is the exception. Most stock markets barely keep up with inflation over time, right? If you, then there's a lot of survivorship biased. What's important in the UK is it's remarkably stable, good rule of law, really good asset quality, uh, really good labour market, which Simon's talked, touched on as well. And then where we are right now is £100 million worth of profit in this country. That cash flow is not really the same as other places, uh, which is a discount. And that perception, is it warranted and why would that change and is it worth it? And the, the first thing we found was I was expecting earnings growth to be slower than most of Europe, and it's not which is very, very strange. You've got companies growing, not massively fast, but the actual underlying companies that are listed on the stock market are growing faster than the competitors that are trading on the premium. And there's a whole host of other things. There's actually 10 things that we looked at. We actually had 23, but we cut them down to the things that we thought were most interesting. And one of the big things we found was it's a very average market, but it's got very big extremes in the tail. So the difference between junky stocks and high quality stocks is huge. Sometimes in the same sector, you can have something trading on six times, another thing trading on 25, which is fantastic, hopefully, for for people like us, hopefully, if we get our analysis right. There's a lot of trends going on. There's nothing you can sort of hang your hat on saying directionality. There's some stuff where you can say, you know, Rolls-Royce has done very well this year and large caps being very much the winner this year. 
And historically, if you have a good large cap year, then small cap follows the following year. It doesn't always, you know, rhymes like that. And that's just a confidence and uncertainty thing drifting away. And I think that's the whole Brexit thing as well. We count the number of RNSs every day and we've been adding them up. And the number of words Brexit has dropped off a cliff. And that's actually in line with the UK doing better. So it's just a, an uncertainty play. Has it been replaced by AI? It did for a little bit. So if every year I give one word to each stock market year in my head. And currently we, it, we had banking crisis. I've switched it to AI. I hope it doesn't end in a war. But yeah, AI, it wasn't as much of a bump. I think we typed into the US and there was 3,000 mentions. And then in the UK, when it got six originally, we've caught up. Do you remember we had the superconductor, room temperature superconductor? The UK was zero. America was already on about 200 straight away. So the UK is just very sleepy. But um, there would have been an investment trust if that had been launched by someone right now, if that turned out to be true. So it gets there. It's a much more conservative marketplace. And there's nothing wrong with being conservative. One of the things you said in your piece is that you felt, I think it was your second point, that the UK was an attractive destination for enterprising companies, which I would agree with. What's the basis of making that assertion? So you're an entrepreneur or you're a sensible CEO of a big organization. You all put down a list of things that are, I don't want to use the word earlier, Mr. Critical is a bit too much, but important to you to make your path to success and your vision realized. And if you're going to either access capital or bigger footprint, or you want to improve your standing of your customers and give them safety, you write all those things down. Actually, it's not about the trendy stuff. And for a lot of this, it's about reducing risk. And the UK, in terms of reducing risk, is a very, very safe option. Now, in terms of getting rich quick and flipping and moving capital around and doing very clever things, it's not going to grab the headlines. But if you're going to do sensible things in a slow manner, which is actually how most businesses are, it's kind of a safe option. It's the largest capital market in Europe still. There's no reason why that's going to change over a long period of time. There are issues. We're very good at finance and attracting commodities. For some reason, we're very, very good at pharmaceuticals, but we don't seem to list them very well or we sell them on. And so there's some anomalies like that, which we kind of sell the family silk regularly. But as a tick box exercise, it's still a top five destination in the world for almost any company. I kind of almost feel like the press and everyone needs to apologise for being English and, and the structural decline in the UK, and it's just not true. So, Laurie, let's bring you in. You're in the process in all this of building a new investment fund in the teeth of what's been a very challenging time for particularly the smaller end of the UK stock market. What have been the main challenges you've faced? Really, the biggest challenge is actually raising enough money to capture what is a once in a generation or in my case once in a lifetime opportunity to buy great assets at a generational discount i'm a very micro stock pacific manager we look at situations especially where change is going on and look to take advantage of that with our investors capital and therefore for the basis of this discussion i'm going to play to my strengths and visualize uk plc the uk stock market as if it were a stock and put it through sort of that lens that I observe, you know, financial assets. In this case, it's a whole market. The UK, let's call it a spade a shovel, has been really trading like a value trap for seven or eight years now. And we all know when that started and why. Someone asked me the other day if I was concerned at how unpopular equity markets are. And I sort of replied, well, I'd be more concerned if they were popular. And that's because I'm a buyer at the moment. I think that much like a stock that is a value trap, At the moment, we need catalysts to redefine the multiple that's being applied. In this case, management change. We all know there's a general election coming. I'm not here to share or spout political views, but I think everyone can probably agree there's been a lot of chop and change within that, which, you know, again, it's fairly objective to say business likes predictability. I don't think we've had that. When we were doing our analysis, the UK is, you know, sixth richest country in the world or a bit more, depending on which numbers you use or less. But it's political stability ranking is 67th in the world. Well, this time last year, we'd had three prime ministers in three months, hadn't we? So, yeah. And if we bring it back to the economics here, and I like, I very much like Laurie's characterization of the UK economy as a particular business, the stability of the management team yields its own reward. The broader economy, though, 
looks at the fact that although you've got a stability of one management team for 13 years, within that, there have been coalitions, there have been short-dated governments, long-dated governments, short-dated parliaments, parliaments prorogued. You know, this is not a backdrop where you can have any certainty on how you price capital? What is the environment I will be playing into when I yield the return for that investment? There is no surprise to me, again, that investment fell off a cliff in 2016, not because of Brexit per se, but because of the political instability that that unleashed. And therefore, if you're a CFO, and you can see this this week, we've had the Deloitte CFO survey that has very consistently shown since 2016, CapEx intentions have been way below their long-term average. Not because the, the CFOs, in my judgment, and I'd be interested in what Alex and Laurie think, not because CFOs are going, this Brexit has fundamentally altered the growth path for the UK economy, but simply how do I price what type of political instability I will be investing into and crucially yielding those returns two, three, four years down the line, because I have no stable view of what that environment looks like. It's uncertainty, isn't it? I mean, who in this room invests in an uncertain scenario? I certainly don't with stocks. I like to know as much as I can before I allocate capital. And he uh, also want to know who you're going to sell to, which was Simon's point earlier. You know, play the players, not just the game. You need to have a reason on who you're going to sell to and avoid the value trap. With the UK, it'd be nice to have a hard stop and hopefully it'll be the election. I know, Laurie, your strategy involves building core positions in meaningful stakes in very illiquid small companies where you need to be very confident in the management that you're backing and be able to engage with that management team. How, in this sort of backdrop, UK company managements have been coping with it? The obvious one to flag right away is the variance and volatility in the price of capital. There are businesses that either could refinance or take out new finance to invest in their own business and sort of indirectly invest in back in UK PLC. And they aren't because every time they open up the model, the key assumption that they need to price the return hurdle in what they're doing, but also you know, how much the thing's going to cost, i.e. the interest rate, keeps moving. I mean, UK government securities are trading like some of those small illiquid microcaps at times. They really are. That you know, A basis point move in a yield is a hell of a lot more of a move in the nominal value, the principle of that security. And there have been some pretty fast and severe yield movements lately. And you know, these are supposed to be the least volatile, most predictable, you know, that word coming up again, securities in the world. So the cost of capital is definitely an issue related to the discussion we're having and the unpredictability of that at the moment. The other, of course, is policy change. The recent dialing back of the EV electric vehicle deadline would be the most sort of recent example. There's a company at the moment we're talking to, an opportunity they have medium to long term is is related to the uptake of batteries effectively. And they've just had to basically tear up their model because their indirect customers have just had a massive deadline removed that they were working towards. Now, Again, not going to sort of get involved in the political debate, but it comes back to this issue of inconsistency. And that's why whether you vote conservative or not, what you can't deny is the unprecedented level of sort of management change in number 10 and therefore associated policies that you know, I would hate to be running a large PLC right now. How on earth do you plan anything? And business is about planning. Businesses are people coming together with a plan or indeed a strategy. The one thing I did want to quickly flag around UK PLC and catalysts alongside management change, of course, the third thing that can drive a, a share price or a valuation of asset alongside its profits and the multiple is the uses of cash. And the UK market has a bit of a dividend heritage, which I think has underserved it the past 15 years because people have thought, seen that a bit sort of backward looking and almost sort of prehistoric. However, in a market where equities are competing against a fixed income market offering a real yield again, you might see UK equities be a little bit stickier than some of their non-yielding competitors, because at the moment, any equity an individual, a fund, an institution holds, they have to compare and contrast against a risk-free mid-single-digit return now. 
an equity that speedy hire, okay, is you know, that business I would talk about, paying a 7 or 8% dividend yield now, holding that while you wait for the markets to recover against an alternative of 6% from a low-risk yielding asset is very different to if I've got a stock in the portfolio that isn't sort of paying me to wait. And I might sort of be tempted to realize that position and park it in, you know, there is an alternative now after 15 years of Tina, there is no alternative. So I think the UK's preference for dividends might come into its own over the next few years if we do have a a new normal of sort of slightly higher rates. We were talking earlier about what the catalyst might be to normalize the relative value of UK equities. And I guess one of them could be the interest rates stop going up or even come down. Don't know if you have got any views on that, Simon. <laughs> do I have views on the interest rate path? I certainly do. Um, none of the major central banks have set out their parameters for cutting rates. So it's very difficult to do anything other than do one of two things, either riff off your greatest hits as an economist on sort of, you know, why you think the economy will evolve as you think it will. The other thing that you can go back on, which I think is slightly more valuable, is to look at previous periods where an aggressively inverted yield curve, like the one we've seen, uninverts. I looked at this long bond yield sell-off and the degree to which that will uninvert the 30-year over two-year spread, which has happened three times previously in the United States. And on the three previous occasions it's happened, on average, the Fed has cut within three months. And we're pretty close to that ton inversion. It's kind of wobbled around the last 10 days or so. But that tells you that when that inflection happens, policy doesn't wait, at least historically, very long. And therefore, for investors going, look, you know, Jay Powell's been right this year and the bond market's been wrong. He's been saying higher for longer. The bond market's starting to believe it. Is Jay Powell going to be right through the cycle? I'd say his predecessors at Federal Reserves have faced the economic reality of a shock, a slowdown, whatever it may be, and have moved to the policy loosening tool pretty quickly, at least historically. Isn't that the point with interest rate reductions? I think there are precious few examples, and I'm sure you'll know better than I, of central bankers just gently clipping away at interest rates, quarter a point at a time, into a sort of sunny uplands of, you know, a nice soft landing or evenly rotating economy, basically what they do is tighten things, over tighten things, something breaks, they panic and what you know, we're 200 basis points lower. Is that the scenario we're facing? Yes, but what I can't do, and I, I think it's really important in my line of work to know what you don't know, I don't know what the trigger for that will be. And that's the difficult thing to stack up. But you're absolutely right that right now, should there be no exogenous shocks, is Jay Powell, Christine Lagarde, Andrew Bailey, are they on the right side of history in terms of interpreting inflation, which is that inflation, once it picks up, the very few precious examples of when it just dissipates away back down to inflation targets seamlessly. It sticks around. There are echoes. There are secondary shocks. And if these long or these fat tails of events don't play out, then it's possible that that's the right prescription, higher for longer plateauing. But my sneaking suspicion is that an event, and quite possibly not the one we're all focusing on in the Middle East, but another event will just change that dynamic. And Jerome Powell and all the central bank community will have to be pragmatists rather than idealists in how they want to get inflation back to target. So I suppose the question is, is how do investors respond in that sort of environment? You can't control what you can't control and you don't know what you don't know to create Simon. So focus on what you can control. Laurie's probably going to be more on this on his given his strategy. And pull as many levers as you can and just keep pushing. Obviously, things on the margin you can drop and it's about how much safety do you want whilst you're going on your journey? What is enough comfort for you to be able to not be pushed out at the wrong time? as well from a trading perspective or life perspective or business perspective. Everybody needs a backup or some rain, some rainy day money. And then you just do the best you can do. Just get on with it is my view. Probably naive. Aunt. What word did you use earlier, Simon? The Panglossian view? I quite like that. Two or three years ago to have just got on with it and bought almost blind of what central banks or central governments may or may not do would have been a bit more of a sort of decision tree than it is now where really 
the timing's being done for you. And actually, whether it's six months, three years, or five years, as long as you're a patient investor, mean reversion is going to be a really helpful tailwind now. And yeah, it's one of the reasons I've done what I've done in my career over the past 12 months. Almost the difficulty at the moment is working out the whole market, all the assets are cheap, which have got, and, and Alex has touched upon it, which have got the idiosyncratic, the catalysts that will see them re-rate and mean revoke perhaps first or earlier or to a greater extent. I think cash generation is definitely part of it because we're in an environment now where that cash is a lot more valuable than it was. Having to borrow it from somewhere else is a lot more expensive than it was. But beyond that, of course, I would say this as an active stock picker, we're going to a lower return environment and the spread within those returns is going to be much higher than it was on a stock by stock basis. And therefore, whilst everything's cheap, I think you've got to find the ones that are going to go from a value trap to a turn. And that really is about a deep dive into what's going on in specific shares and the specific companies that are the security those shares are attached to. One of the things in that context that Simon mentioned earlier is an understanding of or a maybe even a deep analysis of who's going to buy these assets from you once you've bought them. We actually probably spend as much time on exit liquidity as we do entry liquidity. I worked with some pretty bright colleagues during my time at Gresham and we had a well above average track record of of investments exiting via transaction. But again, to Alex's point, I think investing at the moment, you've got a plethora of exit options because you're investing at a time when there's been, tw- I think, 27 months of outflows from your equities. Well, I'm not banging the table saying we're about to get 27 months of inflows, but I would wager at some point we might get 10 months of inflows. And if you can be contrarian right now, this is one of those, you know, really is once in a lifetime opportunities where the liquidity might just take care of itself for those who can be brave and have liquidity at the moment. It is interesting what private equity are doing. It is fits and starts, but I think it's recognizing. There is value, but it's in pockets. And that's why it's fits and starts, to my point. I even went to a restaurant group the other day, which surprised me. <laughs> but I do think it's a profitable trade for them still. You know, We had one of our early winners in Onward. We had DX, DX Group, which was bid for by HIG. And I was delighted to have an early winner in the portfolio, but I was also pretty wistful seeing a company that's earnings and CapEx obligations had been transformed both in the right direction really being taken off the market prematurely and cheaply. I think you had Finsbury Foods a couple of weeks ago as well, similar sort of miserly premium and shareholders on that one are actually speaking up. The value is clearly there and people are starting to recognise it. I think some of the structural strategic changes, if we talk about UK PLC as a company, that Simon talked around at the start are really crucial because public markets just can't rely on private markets. Otherwise, there won't be a public market one day. And I think everyone recognizes the benefit of having a public market. Well, if I can come in on that point, do they? I think we do, collective company. But is and one of the things I've tried to use my platform to do is make the social case for capital markets and particularly public markets. And not just because, you know, I have an obvious vested interest in that, but actually from a economic efficiency, allocative efficiency standpoint, that's what the social license to use a dare turner is, um, or slightly butcher his quote, the social function of the capital markets is to find the most efficient home for capital. And I think part of the problem in recent years, and I welcome other people's views, is that the attractions of being a public company have been quite considerably diluted. The incentive for management teams, particularly finance directors, to become private finance directors, not public finance directors, is significant. With the erosion of liquidity, and I've done a lot of analysis on uh, liquidity, then suddenly the advantage that that infers on a public company starts to be eroded. And while I think the penny has dropped at the regulator and the government level, has that penny dropped far enough to understand that, and my frustration, and Jeremy, you asked, you know, I think you were going to ask him about the difference between life in the uh, financial services sector and life in the civil service. I look sometimes at the, some of the missives coming out from the Department for Business or the Treasury 
that focus the reporting obligations, all of which are very good on, you know, and this is not weasel words, on environmental ESG, corporate governance. They're all framed in terms of public companies must do this, public companies must do that. And the delta that that creates between the governance obligations, the reporting obligations of a public company versus a private companies have moved much wider in recent years. And I think in terms of maintaining the incentives to be a public company and all the advantages economically that that generates, I think we as an industry have to make the case for it and regulators and governments have to listen. That's interesting. I, I just assumed probably maybe naively or wrongly, the 5.5% interest rates or whatever they are will force a re-equitization of public, privately held businesses because the cost of debt has gone up and it's the private equity model must be under strain. I'm sure all the things you're saying is right. I mean, that's clearly correct. And the evidence, I suppose, out there is supports your argument that companies are still being taken off the UK stock market, sometimes prematurely. You're right. But it's just the colossal amount of money that's raised. It's just the funds are much, much larger now. There's a lot more companies. So the growth of the industry and the capital that has to be deployed is huge. And they'll do a vintage every year. And they'll deploy every year. It doesn't matter whether the cost of debt is or cost of debt. And they'll assume, well, that's priced into the unit cost I'm buying. Or cheap. I'm buying the business cheaper, right? So it's priced in. And so they still want to do their trade. So the sheer volume is still there. A lot of the deals are going to struggle, so you're totally right, but there's still going to be a volume of buyers there. I think it's going to be interesting to see. The most important one for me that I've done a lot of work on that I'm waiting to happen is the IPOs, because that can be self-fulfilling. That's a confidence game. I'd imagine Simon's looking for those as well. Yeah, well, they're, you know, the, the IPOs are the reason for the market, and it's not just people exiting, and then they get your capital and do good things, and it's story, and it's new, and it's fresh, and who wants to watch, you know, there's old films that are classics, but we all watch the new films, right? And we'll make a judge in Oppenheimer or Barbie or whatever, and I'll remember them all we way. Without that and the difference between those businesses, then if you assume it's a bad place and they don't come, then it starts to really hurt. When they come, what happens is the window opens normally, and then you get a flood. Uh, we've had, we had a little go of cab payments, but it didn't work. Well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, look, there were 128 UK IPOs in 2021, and on average, those are 50%. 55%, I think, last time I checked, below water across that cohort. The only good news... Is the IPO of the year is the small cap trust that Laurie runs? Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> it's robbed. It's robbed, I heard. <laughs> the good news is that there was an IPO surge in Europe and the US. And last time I checked, the European ones were 62% underwater and the US ones were 64 Five, 66% underwater. So actually, although they've been a really poor performing cohort, and was it the last into portfolio first out, quite possibly as the rate cycle turned, but relatively, and this frustrated the hell out of me when people who should know better in financial journalism writing up about you know failed UK IPOs didn't bother to benchmark the full 2021 cohort around the world and seen that it was not a uniquely British phenomenon, which goes back to the very start of this podcast, where I said, look, a lot of the issues that we face in terms of capital markets, de-equitization, concentration risk, and then at the economic level from demographics are things that pretty much every developed economy and capital market in the world is dealing with in some version. And for some reason, and I'd love to know why, a lot of our commentary believes that we're some way unique in that regard. The Birkenstock and USA IPO still went down, didn't it? I think we should all agree we should get the insurance companies to buy equities again. <laughs> and then it will be fixed. Well, indeed. But I mean, the Mansion House Compact is one of those mechanisms by which the pension funds reverse that journey because, of course, unlisted equity includes AIM and Aquis listed shares and does 
Andrew Griffith and the Treasury think that the 5% target is a de minimis and actually they would like to go higher? And will they, if they don't get too much incoming flack from the savings industry about reinforcing home bias, would they like to, over time, and it may not be their decision, it might be Rachel Reeves's, look to extend that up the capitalization scale and onto the main market? Yes, I think they would. But a bit like when they did the last big pensions reform, at least the one I think is the last big one, auto enrollment into workplace pensions. Which big public policy success, which is not something you normally say about pensions. They started slowly in terms of contributions and then began to ramp them up as people staged through, as they tested it, saw whether they'd broken anything, and then pressed on. I think we may see something similar with the Mansion House Compact, which, in terms of making the insurance companies the natural buyer of UK equities, that is a long overdue change in the investing ecosystem. I think I predate all of you because when I was a sell side broking salesman, institutional salesman in the late, mid late 1980s, the big clients, the big movers and shakers of small investing in UK small cap were the pension funds of the big companies, you know, British coal pension fund, British gas pension fund, the post office pension fund, and each had teams of half a dozen people just looking at UK smaller companies because UK equities were 20 odd percent of their overall portfolios. And today it's two or low single digit for sure, if they do it at all. And if they probably do it via just index hugging. I, I mean, that is a factor in all this in terms of trying to gauge the catalyst. Is it just more difficult to change things, this undervaluation of the UK in a world dominated by global investors who are tracking indices that are basically run off historic benchmarks. If we invest looking through the rearview mirror, nothing's ever going to change. Well, that's a a great question. And um, I mean, I made myself somewhat unpopular by, again, as usual, uh, by writing in my Times column back in May that there should be a tax on passive investment instruments because they're contributing nothing to price discovery. Uh, and the very social function that I go back to of capital markets is is not added to by passive allocation. Now, of course, the usual suspects attacked me for being a, you know, a sort of shop steward, if you like, for my industry. And, and I get that I have a vested interest, but This is why I try to elevate the conversation to one of allocative efficiency, economic efficiency, the function of capital markets. The fact that the marginal dollar, euro, pound is being invested in a passive instrument does allow, and I think Laurie touched on it, those alpha generating opportunities, those arbitrage opportunities to blow out wider than their historical range because there isn't the active capital to come in and close that. The challenge is, of course, the most famous of all economists said, Keynes said, you know, the market can remain irrational longer than I can remain solvent. And therein lies the real challenge for active investors looking at the pricing that we've generated, the concentration, the super, I think Alex mentioned super seven in the US. This is not a UK specific, this is a global capital market story. The opportunity to arbitrage that is there. And I think everybody who looks at the behavior of pricing can see that. It's quite difficult to do when there is a steamroller of uh, funds going in the opposite direction. I heard Katie Potts talk on this. She made a very interesting point that she felt that the regulation of our industry in the last 20 years has been driven purely through the lens of the investor, not through the issuer. And I thought she scored a brilliant goal on behalf of price discovery purposes of the uh, objective function of uh, capital markets and how it has been ignored by all parties in this just relentless move towards passive investment. I think as well, just to interject related to that, it's also been one of focused on cost rather than outcomes for 15 to 20 years. And there's a debate the extent to which this is true, but I think there's definitely some form of inverse correlation between cost put into something and the quality of the outcome that comes out the other end. And lo and behold, after 20 years of 
reducing costs wherever we can for an admirable and at times correct reasons. Lo and behold, 20 years later, we've got a market that's got lots of bad outcomes we're now debating as a problem. I could ask each of you to do a quick elevator pitch on the case for investing in the UK. A theme we've covered, which is the political stability that may be around the corner, which is long overdue. Rachel Reeves, Keir Starmer have coined this phrase, securonomics, which went down very well with the US investor base when Rachel Reeves went over to New York and Washington earlier in the year. And furthermore, the same people who advised Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, the new Labour project, are now advising Keir Starmer. And you could see the desire not to give the gilt market, the equity market, sterling market, the opportunity to sell off on a change of government, but say, look, we are going to repeat, play it again, Sam, isn't it, with the 1997 playbook of trying to minimize, I think from memory, and again, Jeremy will contradict me if I'm wrong, Gordon Brown took Ken Clark's spending plans for 98-99 and rolled them forward. It was very unpopular at the time with his backbenchers. But actually, and as a way of saying, look, we're not going to come in and completely tear things up, but we're going to provide a degree of stability, it worked. And actually, and this is where I'll finish, Investors have good memories, and good memories particularly of the UK economy and equity markets performance in the back end of the 90s, and actually as the dot-com bubble burst, the UK outperformed. So that period actually provides helpful memories of the UK index outperforming its global benchmark. And so if we are going to play it again, Sam, at a political level, is there a reason for investors to allocate to the UK? I think there is. The case to UK equities, well, on this podcast, I've sort of visualized UK PLC as a stock itself. It's a cheap stock, but has been and increasingly so for some time. The driver of upside in any stock is its earning and earnings, its multiple and its uses of cash. I think in the case of UK PLC, we now have, as discussed on this chat today, direct sight on a number of catalysts that can improve, especially the multiple and the profits within the country. To highlight a few very quickly, management change, that's coming, not a political view, but I think it will be a more stable regime than we've certainly had in the past five years. That increases predictability. That's positive for the multiple. There's already strategy change, whether it's at the micro level in the form of the Mansion House Compact, another initiative Simon is sort of supporting and working on with the Treasury to higher level economic policy I think there's a recognition of the need to improve strategy. That's happening again. I think that will improve earnings, investment in the country, but also, again, the multiple that's supplied in the form this time increased by side liquidity. And then finally, the earnings themselves. What we haven't talked about today is that we're in the midst of a very, very tough trading environment for companies, whether they're listed or not. And again, if you to look at cyclical economics, it's safe to say in the next 12 to 18 months, that ought to improve as well. And really, therefore, there is a sort of basket of catalysts brewing now to re-rate the UK stock market. For me, it's a a a once-in-a-decade trade. There's prime assets, high-quality businesses, and they're not going anywhere. And particularly the ones that are global, if you hold them for long enough, you'll do okay. But the thing much more near-term is the, the cash flows and the earnings. There's a lot more companies growing their earnings than declining, and the, the uncertainty is drifting down. And so the other parts would be nice on re-rating and all the rest of it, but you're really relying on what other investors do. If you're buying businesses that are high-quality franchises that are going to keep growing their business faster than their competitors, you're always going to end up in a relatively better place, which at the end of the day is the point of the game. Thank you, guys. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for making it happen. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of In the Company of Mavericks, please subscribe at our website, inthecompanyofmavericks.com, where we would appreciate your feedback and any suggestions you might have for future episodes.